Hmm, I wonder what's going to be in this video. So you want to learn how to make doom bases, huh? Well, let me take you on a journey. Hey, hey, what is up? Um, so basically, I'm going to be showing you guys exactly how to kind of recreate those really crunchy, delicious bases which you'll have heard off the Doom 2016 and Eternal soundtracks. Now, obviously, these soundtracks are beloved to many for a very, very good reason. Like, they've had so much thought and production put into them, and they're unique in the kind of way, like, Mick Gordon likes to deliver on a soundtrack. Like, he really likes to kind of take an idea and run with it and deliver on that in a very well-packaged way, I'm going to describe it as. So, who am I, what do I do, and why should you care? Well, I've been doing music production for about four years now, but I've been on a very accelerated path due to, you know, obviously lockdown occurring. So I basically decided to teach myself this very intently as I had nothing else to do. So to go back onto the actual topic, we're going to kind of cover that Doom instrument as showed off in the GDC talk in as much detail as I can really deliver because I feel like I've definitely decoded this thing in a way where you can use it actually in your DAW just using plugins you don't have to buy all the really expensive hardware so like at least following along to this and maybe trying to pick up some of those tricks is what you want to do if you want a similar sound. So I'm going to kind of give a literature review on what's been done to <laughs> cite the kind of thing I do on my uni courses and whatnot but um, essentially when I look at other attempts at this I see that they're very concerned with results. And this is completely fine, like, you want something to sound good, and I get it, like, you make something that sounds really cool and you want it to show it off, and you want to show it off to other people, basically. You know what I mean. Um, so, probably one of the best of these was done by Dresden, where he did his kind of switching between different distortions method, and then obviously used a MIDI controller to kind of dynamically control that, and it sounded really good, to be honest, but... It's not the same thing in practicality. And then I guess another really good attempt in terms of results was the one done by Keep Forest, where they do this kind of like resample array from a bunch of really distorted like bass sounds and it works. Like don't get me wrong, it definitely works, but it doesn't like have the same flow and feel as the kind of thing I've created, and I don't think it is as true to the original. Voice well, about about a year and a half trying to actually figure this thing out and you know everyone knows the GDC talk so I basically just watched that over many many times and picked apart every specific little detail and in that he had a list of all the effects he used the hardware so I basically um, with them worked out what the individual components instead of electronic instruments do and then actually reconstructed the thing to as real a way as possible using virtual VSTs. So I originally had quite a few shots of this back in the day and I've never really kind of talked about this. I actually made a video a really like long while back. Bruh, look at this dude. <laughs> Wait till you see the... <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> where I made this kind of industrial bass instrument, but you can only really dull it in to a specific amplitude that only work around specific frequencies. It wasn't this dynamic thing that would flow and fit the riff that you could essentially just pulse different rhythms through and, you know, have it work in a lot of circumstances, as is this new kind of model that I've uh, essentially created. Yeah, this is what happens when you stay up all night. I've got major ear fatigue. <laughs> I've come a long way since then. Now, I've been really learning and following the trail behind how each individual part of this like Doom Array instrument um, was created and as I've followed along I've, I've really found that I'm getting close to the original sound if not the exact same but obviously I'm using plugins and the original was done on hardware so there's going to be discrepancies this and that and the other but the advantage of plugins will be that you can automate them and really dial them in and you know do all this extra stuff that can't be done on hardware digitally. So, 
in light of this, I'm going to now pop up a new diagram based on the one from the GDC talk, which essentially shows you the method which you can do this virtually, and it kind of unifies all the different ways which you could approach doing this, because you don't need to use any specific plugin or like specific bit of hardware even. Uh, you can kind of create this thing based on the kind of components that were just in the pedals and the effects that were used on the original Doom Array. So, what we've got to do here is look at the big picture. This thing is essentially something that makes sound effects for any appropriate purpose and essentially will just create basses and riffs infinitely. So what you've got to do is you've got to make it have that ability to automate and be dynamic. Now, the way you do this is by changing the gain of the actual input signal going in and that will trigger everything kind of like a gate but also not. You've got to imagine that first example of David Bowie and the gate reverbs, how they managed to make that uh, increase the effect as he essentially sang louder. So I'm going to definitely talk about that David Bowie example because it is essentially how this thing works. Now, they talk about the kind of gating system that occurs and the way that this is implemented in the Doom Array is essentially you have a sine wave patch and it also has noise in it by the way. So the noise is ring modded by the sine wave and they're both pulsed through a single patch and sometimes they put like a channel strip on the end to stop it clipping or whatever. But that aside, essentially this thing is a sine wave and what you can do is you can change the amplitude. So the master gain on your plugin that you're using, you change the amplitude and that will vary the type of effect. Now, you don't actually need to use a gate on this thing because there are these wave shapers and there's these bit crushes and there's the, all these types of saturation that essentially occur when they go beyond a certain threshold. So this already gates itself in terms of, you know, effects. And you can even set the different... I mean, you could still gate it if you wanted to, but you can set the different gains of the effects, for instance, on a plugin like Tactical Nuke. Um, on one of the channels where maybe the one where you've got all the kind of like phaser emulations on which I'll talk about later on but the ones where you got all the phaser emulations on and you can have that trigger when the game gets like greater and then you get all this like phasing stuff going on. So why do I think that this array was made in the first place because I'm really trying to understand why he went out of his way to create something kind of so complicated and not just, you know, stick to the book. Obviously, he talked about wanting to create something that no one's ever heard before, but there's another reason why this thing works really well. It creates you sound effects and song parts, which you can then just kind of, I guess, resample, but more just grab bits out of it and then stick them in your main session or, you know, just bounce them out and then, like, just put them in your, like, song structure as, like, sound effects. And it will create them dynamically based on the song part. And this is thanks to, you know, all the different types of distortion, the gain changing, and all the different echoes that come in, and the thing's so compressed, and it's all right to the same bus that it sounds cohesive. And this is really, like, the cool element of this thing, and why it can be so useful. Now... I can talk more about the kind of industrial scene and the kind of computer music kind of stuff. There's actually this band called Empty Set, which um, Soundtrack to the Apocalypse actually showed me when I was talking to him uh, a while back. And they're actually from my hometown of Bristol, which is quite nice. Um, I tried to send them a message, but they haven't replied yet. So I don't know. I, I've, I'm quite a fan of them and they do actually kind of similar computer music array style stuff. So it's nothing majorly new but I guess Mick Gordon kind of coined the idea and used it in a way that was very accepted by the public I guess and you know it was a very good implementation of it so any kind of way this works whatever inspired him to do this and obviously his, him putting in his own work and actually making it become a real thing is what people really coin as the Doom instrument and why it was fundamental in the Doom 2016 soundtrack. Now I'm going to point out some examples of the Doom 2016 soundtrack, which I believed it was used after I've created this emulation which creates very, very similar sounds now.
And you may have noticed I actually snuck in one of my own examples there to see if you guys would notice and, uh, you know, see how similar that is to the actual thing. Now that I'm uh, kind of talking on to this topic. So I'm going to be very specific again. This thing uses sine waves and noise pulsed through it. Now this was quite a big misconception at the start, especially in the Argent Metal server where we'd be like, oh no, this thing is just sine waves, you know, it's a sine wave corruptor. That's all the stuff that works. And to be honest, uh, you can put like high frequency sine waves, you can put like melodies into this thing and it will genuinely give you quite interesting results. But generally, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, uh, you want to put stuff around the kind of sub octave range into it in the first place because that's where it really shines That's how it makes all these crunchy bases and weird sound effects and that's how this thing essentially fundamentally works So I'm gonna talk about the three of the four channels which you're going to move on and emulate here now cutting to the DAW, I'm going to show you the kind of setup you're going to want to use to do this virtually really. So I like to do my sessions just as individual sound design sessions then kind of bounce out, render out. I like to use this thing called the audio pool as well, which um, is a very nice, useful thing. This is actually a template, so I shouldn't have all these things here right now. But um, so we've created a session for this. And so how are you going to set up your session? I quite like to record my stuff. So these are set up to record the, um, the different uh, bus channels here. Um, I like to run that and record it and kind of like bounce out that way. Um, but generally speaking, you're going to want three channels to be done virtually here to give you the kind of sound of the effects. And those are your crunchy distortion channels, your kind of tape echo channel, and it's your phaser channel. Now, these three are really kind of the fundamental of the sound and the fourth one is just the feedback loop that gets used and there's many ways you can kind of emulate a feedback loop you can kind of run extra like high frequency sine waves into this thing as well and you can also like you know just actually recreate it um either like an in route feedback loop which i've done a previous tutorial on um in your in your kind of audio interface which can be done internally or you can just get a guitar amplifier and the microphone, this is my preferred method of doing it. I actually use this microphone here and, you know, actually record some real feedback. And it isn't that hard to do and it's actually quite low cost. Uh, See, the funny thing about this is now I'm just getting a bunch of weird sounds because it's just aliasing all over the place. But let's actually record this thing in. I can hear the, um, the rest of the bass in my headphones. I use two audio interfaces uh, to set this up. Let me show you this up. Yeah. So that's the, the amp, very makeshift microphone stand, you know, this mini amp. Um, I guess this is the two audio interfaces. Oh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, considering you can probably be spending money on these plugins anyway. You can do it for free, but there are some actual emulations of the gear used. So hence why you will want to essentially recreate it using these ones I've decided to pick. So let's get a look at the actual individual plugins and the associated pedals for them. So this is actually part of one of my free sample packs which is up on my website and I kind of made a bunch of shots, well one shot sounds from this array. I actually stacked some extra trans and stuff in there as well. So, but um, it also contains a text file of all the original pedals used on the Doom array and essentially the individual plugins I used to create it this time around. Uh, I changed the plugins I use quite a bit because I'll find something either like works better or you know you know or maybe I'm going for a different sound and I'll change the setting so it sounds completely different this that and the other. I'll, I'll often do different processing on the bus including um, you know stuff with ozone to really get the stereo uh, dialed in and whatnot if we look here. Um, but generally speaking you know this these are the pedals that were used and stayed in the GDC talk. If you follow this, you're going to pretty much get the sound. Um, so yeah, I'm going to now go into which bit of this virtual array corresponds to which of these pedals. Alright, so starting on the distortion channel, uh, as makes sense, we're going to look up essentially the emulation of the RML 432K distortion box. Now, this thing actually has a filter on it. Um, as well, but I don't really use it too much. I, well, I don't use a filter in this case too much, so I mainly just use the element of it, of the fact that it is essentially an op-amp distortion. 
as well as a transistor distortion. And what I tend to do is I use something like Splitter in Studio One, and I split the signal so I, I'm running it through both these distortions at once, and then that goes into the rest of the chain. As you can see here, mixes, you know, 50, this and the other. The next element that we're going to aim to try and emulate is essentially the Metasonic's KV100 Ass Blaster. Now I don't know if this is going to get me like demonetized or age restricted or something. So I'm just going to I'm just going to not show the plugin. Um, it's listed. It's uh, essentially it's a emulation of the TM7, and the TM7 itself is used essentially in, as the preamp of the KV100, so like the, the amp, you know, the distortion from that is used as the preamp of the KV100. So in emulating the KV100, we're gonna then break it down into its respective parts. And another benefit, I guess, of the virtual array is you can do things on the TM7 emulation, which you wouldn't actually be able to do in the real thing, which is quite fun. Um, so moving on from that TM7 emulation, which is done, it's a free plugin, by the way, a user plugin created by someone in React to 6FX. Uh, we're going to talk about the fact that there's a kind of wave shaper slash pulser. So for this, I choose like just M wave shaper. You know, it's free. Uh, you can grab it. I really recommend it. And you know, just something like this. You can play around with it. Um, you know, and then you know, just to get different sounds from it. And then obviously after that, I believe in the circuit, there's a ring modulation. And the fun thing about this is you can either do dual ring modulation or by turning the wave shaper off or you can you know just uh, have the wave shaper and then just one of these running that's to be true to the actual array uh, but in the virtual case you can just do whatever you want essentially um, and after that there's normally um, essentially what is a filter like a resonant filter slash wow thing but in this case I haven't decided to put it on um, you know, on the end of the KV100, there's kind of like a... It, I think it acts like a wah pedal, uh, if I remember correctly, like an auto wah pedal. With an envelope on and a filter. And you can switch between the envelope mode and, you know, just the normal filtered mode. So basically that thing is, is something you can stick on here, and it's quite fun. But I haven't done it in this case because I wasn't going after that specific sound. The next plugin I decided to choose is essentially just the emulation of the Geiger counter. And this one gets talked about a lot. It's a wave shaper, bit crusher, preamp distortion, tone, filter, you know, sample rate, bit depth. Got everything you essentially want. Dual wave tables. The virtual version of this is really fun. You can do it in stereo as well. Um, so I really recommend getting this. And then finally, you want some kind of fuzz on the end of the distortion channel. And I like to use Bias FX Fuzz Modeler. Uh, if it will load. Okay, so here we are. Um, Bias FX Fuzz Modeler. And what this does, the reason why I like using this is because you can choose all these different types of fuzz circuits. You can add octave and you can do EQ. Uh, it's really versatile. Uh, plus, another thing you want to note, if you're going to bias effects, turn all this off um, and, you know, max the input and the output, it's going to essentially not affect your signal because there's some sort of guitar engine thing going on. It likes to auto-tune the gain and whatnot, and whatnot you know. Um, so next, let's move on to the tape echo channel. So, probably the star of this and from a package that I really recommend getting like an audio pack is by the Waves Factory guys and it's called Echo Cat. Now this thing is essentially just a pure emulation of the Watson Copycat which is a really famous uh, type of tape echo so basically what you're going to want to do with this is just put it on there and have fun with it. Uh, it's got a bunch of effects you can do whatever with it and that'll give you the, the majority of your kind of echo sounds. Next is tube saturation. Now Mick used like a I believe it was a Trogatronic pedal, the P77, and it essentially gets used for kind of compression, quote unquote. Now, I believe you can drive this thing, but um, generally speaking, you know, it, it does also work well for a kind of compressive sound. Hence the reason why I've chosen this very nice, clean tube saturator, which I have. I also do a bit of EQ here now and then, um, but you know, that's how that works. I've decided to put a transient designer if it loads uh, here and quantum's a really cool one because you can actually EQ um, the attack and the sustain differently and add different effects and stuff so that's really really fun if you really wanted to hone in the sound and then finally last but not least is another waves factory plugin uh, called the cassette 
and it's from their big bundle um, which I actually really recommend getting is quite well priced and this will let you switch between different tape sounds and whatnot um, and really help you get that ideal tape emulation sound and you're going to want to drive this quite hard. Last but not least of the three virtual channels is going to be the phaser channel and this one's pretty simple another Geiger counter already talked about that um, it has it has a Metasonics T3 on it uh, on this chain and I wasn't quite sure how to emulate it but you know, all the Metasonic stuff is essentially just really old vintage tubes which get really nasty when you install them. So I just chose this really bad tube um, setting and, and just ran with that because it works in quite a fun way. Next is this emulation of the Mutron biphase. I believe it's a Mutron biphase. I could be wrong. Someone can correct me. And then we just slap a stock phaser on there. I should probably also mention the bus channel settings. Now, I'm doing a lot here, as you can see, but really all this is, is a bit of EQ, um, generally speaking. Uh, I don't know why I'm EQing twice here, but the real star of what you want to do on the bus after the EQ is this, a kind of 76 style compressor, and this is a very transient style effect compressor. It's going to saturate in a certain way and make this transient sound really authentic and nice. Another honourable mention, and this gets used by Mick Gordon quite a bit as well, is uh, the Tone 2 Acoustics plugin. Um, and it's going to do a bunch of nice stereo enhancements. What works particularly well is, you know, narrowing down the low end, so making that mono, and using the laser punch setting, and, you know, multi sire and smart filter as well, if you really want to bring out the high end. This is kind of like my honourable mention for getting that really crisp sound at the end of this. So what you'll find is you'll find yourself on the trail trying to chase that similar sound now that you're in the right ballpark within the same kind of atomic gravity that was originally used for the first concepts of it. So now you've got to reach the top of that mountain and make something which you think is worthy of being called a new instrument. Now the faster you run towards it and the more dedicated you are the faster you will get that sound that you want. And it may be like the actual sound, but it may be completely different. It all depends on how orthodox you want to be with it. One last thing I need to mention before we look at all the demos is the type of automation you're going to do here. So obviously, um, in this case, I am just editing the master gain on the output. And what this is doing is it's editing the slider on the exit. So this would be the same in Serum or whichever patch you decide to use. You edit this out here and that controls the entire volume of the whole patch. And another thing I also like to do, which I haven't done necessarily here, is to put a nice channel strip, nice mono channel strip on the end of this. And then that will essentially, uh, when it starts clipping, give a more analog sound if you're driving it really hard. Another thing I should probably mention is uh, to set up some macros on your patch. Um, you'll notice at times the kind of sine wave sounds a lot more like a kick drum, or it might sound a lot noisier, or it might sound like, you know, have different kind of signy, noisy elements, like different color, noise color even. Uh, and you're going to want to be able to automate all of that, as that's essentially what gives it that moving kind of morphing sound. So, yeah, now that that's covered, let's listen to some sound demos.
now. So now, you'll, you'll have reached the top of this mountain and you'll wonder, what do I do now? And the answer is, you run down the mountain and it's going to be a lot easier. Side note, look at this. What the heck? That's not nice. I think I'll find a little route in the forest. Yeah. Oh, shortcut. Oh, a round cut rather. Look at this. Very nice. So, as you can probably hear, I think that's quite accurate. Um, obviously, it could do with some kind of reprocessing and, you know, maybe a bit of like transformative EQ going on. You know, you could resample it and do this and the other with that. But as a base and just a raw kind of thing, just with a little bit of automation on the feedback loop, because you kind of have to automate that thing anyway. Um, you know, I think it's really a good representation of how this thing can be used and the ways which it can definitely serve some songs. So what I'm going to show you now are a few song demos from actual songs where I've used this method in to varying methods and varying results to, to kind of get like the variation of sounds out of it. The first one of these is going to be from Spawn of Kafuba, which I actually did a production montage from and uh, this one was really focused on using that sound but with a lot of kind of like vowel like transformative EQ from Morph EQ. So I'm going to show you a quick clip of the DAW in that. The next is off one of the collaborative album songs, so it was an outro, and basically uh, you might have heard it on the single release, but basically it's um it's the Doom instrument, but I made it really meaty with some like extra compilation and stereo effects. So let's give it a listen. And the final one is actually going to be an unreleased track, uh, kind of a secret one. I'm not going to tell you when it's going to get released, but you might like the sound design in it. And I will actually put this clip up on my Patreon, um, probably a one minute clip of it and also maybe some stems to it. Um, so yeah.
off merchandise. No way. So yeah, I'm being your standard like music marketer person and just like absolutely creating a bunch of like monetized platforms this and the other. So uh, to be an absolute scumbag, I'm just going to remind you guys that uh, <laughs> the merch is up and I'm using a Teespring for it. The, they come out quite nice. Uh, I've had a few quality control issues uh, with some of the tank tops, but you know, if you fancy getting some custom design merch, then come pick this up. Um, I will be releasing uh, a very in-depth like kind of turning the plugins on and off and actually showing the actual effect of the sound because i think that would, that's way too like long form for a youtube video like this uh, i will be releasing that on my patreon so if you want that kind of really really deep dive content i suggest you go there along with some of the stems uh, for this and the actual like files and different things if you want to resample them do whatever with them uh so yeah that's that so we're going to be releasing the album Holy Ghost soon. It's going to come out in April, essentially, and it will be available early on Patreon, um, of course, probably. It will be on the lowest tier, so it'll be really easy to access. We're just doing that so, you know, people can listen to it early because we're going to plan a bunch of marketing and stuff and the other, a bunch of music videos, all that fun stuff that goes into making an actual music release. Um, otherwise, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment. If Mick's watching this, I would very much like to hear your feedback, or from anyone who's a composer, or just in general. So, you know, anything to enlighten and improve the process, I would really like to learn. But please leave your thoughts in the comment section. Thank you very much.